Welcome to our Easter service. Please join in our opening response. Hallelujah! Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Morning everybody and welcome to our Easter service. Whether you are known to us or whether you are joining us for the very first time, it's great to have you with us today. As many of you know, um, I've been ill recently, so I'm delighted to be able to celebrate today in your company. I'm certainly no longer taking for granted the ability to be able to speak and to breathe at the same time. I must, however, just take a moment to say thank you. Thank you to all of you who have kept things running over the past few weeks. And a very particular thank you to all of you, and I know there were many who have been praying for me during this difficult time. I thank you for the messages, for the dozen freshly laid eggs and the bag of oranges which were left on my doorstep, for the checking up on me that you've done, and so much more besides. The gift of our earthly family of God should never be underestimated. Whilst rattling at times with large quantities of medication, it felt like I spent a long time just trying to breathe, with the pain of doing that almost becoming irrelevant sometimes. There were times when I felt frightened, and yet there were times when I experienced the most amazing gift of peace, which can have only been God-given. I was relying on God, trusting him, that he wants the very best for each of us. God's love is just amazing. And without wanting to sound at all dramatic, there were times when I wondered if I would see loved ones again. So at these times, I was also trusting that God wanted the very best for them too. Within our current context of COVID-19, at the moment, we find ourselves in strange and very difficult times. Some of us have lost loved ones and unfortunately, yet more of us will lose loved ones. We are in lockdown, separated from those that we care about, perhaps feeling isolated, scared, and for all kinds of reasons worried. Yet, we do know that the very best thing that we can do is to stay at home. That's the best thing for us and the best thing for everybody else. So please do try to stay at home. We do have a choice though to make at this time. We can try to get through this relying on ourselves or we can choose to do it in the company of God. Jesus is here, living amongst us and the horror of everything that's going on at the moment, he's with us. God is not an absent God. He's going through whatever each of us are experiencing with us in the here and now. In Jesus, we have a reason to hope. As we celebrate Easter, we remember that on that first Easter morning, love escaped from the tomb. And that is precisely why we're here to celebrate today. <coughs> Enough rambling from a recovering vicar. We've got a wonderful service ahead of us as together we explore and celebrate the true meaning of Easter, we will hear from many people, we will sing, we will pray, we will hear scripture, and we will celebrate the true meaning of Christ's victory over death and his resurrection, which speak of the eternal life offered to each one of us, every one of us, 
if we choose to believe in him. Jesus is alive. Let's celebrate. The sun stops shining. So you are a king, are you? The Roman soldiers jeered. Then you'll need a crown and a robe. They gave Jesus a crown made out of thorns and put a purple robe on him and pretended to bow down to him. Your majesty, they said. Then they whipped him and spat on him. They didn't understand that this was the Prince of Life, the King of Heaven and Earth, who had come to rescue them. The soldiers made him a sign, our King, and nailed it to a wooden cross. They walked up a hill outside the city. Jesus carried the cross on his back. Jesus had never done anything wrong. But they were going to kill him, the way criminals were killed. They nailed Jesus to the cross. Father, forgive them, Jesus gasped. They don't understand what they are doing. You say you've come to rescue us, people shouted. But you can't even rescue yourself. But they were wrong. Jesus could have rescued himself. A legion of angels would have flown to his side if he'd called. If you were really the Son of God, you could just climb down off that cross, they said. And of course they were right. Jesus could have just climbed down. Actually, he could have just said a word and made it stop. Like when he healed that little girl and stilled the storm and fed 5,000 people. But Jesus stayed. You see, they didn't understand. It wasn't the nails that kept Jesus there. It was love. Papa, Jesus cried, frantically searching the sky. Papa, where are you? Don't leave me. And for the first time and the last, when he spoke, Nothing happened, just a horrible, endless silence. God didn't answer. He turned away from his boy. Tears rolled down Jesus' face, the face of the one who would wipe away every tear from every eye. Even though it was midday, a dreadful darkness covered the face of the world. The sun could not shine. The earth trembled and quaked. The great mountains shook. Rocks split in two until it seemed that the whole world would break, that creation would tear itself apart. The full force of the storm of God's fierce anger at sin was coming down on his own son instead of his people. It was the only way that God could destroy sin and not destroy his children whose hearts were filled with sin. Then Jesus shouted in a loud voice, It is finished! And it was. He had done it. Jesus had rescued the whole world. Father, Jesus cried, I give you my life. And with a great sigh, he let himself die. Strange clouds and shadows filled the sky, purple, orange, black, like a bruise. Jesus' friends gently carried Jesus. They laid Jesus in a new tomb carved out of rock. How could Jesus die? What had gone wrong? 
what did it mean? They didn't know anything anymore, except they did know their hearts were breaking. That's the end of Jesus, the leaders said. But just to be sure, they sent strong soldiers to guard the tomb. They hauled a huge stone in front of the door to the tomb so that no one could get in or out. I hugely admire people who are known as complete finishers because I'm not one of them. Almost four years on from moving into Appley Bridge, there's still stuff in the garage which isn't sorted. There are books on the shelves which are half finished, files and papers that need to either be kept or shredded. Despite, despite perhaps having more time because of us being in lockdown, maybe for you it might be an unfinished DIY project an abandoned diet, a partly completed garden project, or maybe even an unresolved relationship challenge. I think it's fair to say that many of us have a tendency to stop before we've crossed the finishing line. And it can happen to the best of us. Michelangelo, who has to be one of the greatest artists of all time, would often begin a project only to abandon it in a fit of anger. Amazingly, when he died, he left more unfinished works than completed ones. There are lots of things in life which remain unfinished. And many people go to their grave without finishing what they really wanted to do or achieve. But as we've heard in the Bible reading, Jesus wasn't one of them. Having been nailed to the cross, he prayed for forgiveness for those who'd put him there. Having been taunted to come down off the cross, which as God's son he could have done, he stayed. And yes, there were nails through his hands and his feet, but actually it was his love for you and me that held him there. Jesus knew that the only way we could be forgiven and have the relationship with God for which we were created was through him. The only perfect person who has ever walked this earth, taking our place. And then after all the agony, there are those last words before he dies, as he cries out, It is finished! In the language he would have used, the three words are actually just one. It's the word tetelestai. In Jesus' day and world, if a carpenter finished a perfect piece of furniture, he might look at it and say, tetelestai. An artist, after putting the finishing touches to a canvas, might step back and say, tetelestai. Perhaps as we think of the cross, most significantly, it was a banking term. When a person had fully paid off a debt, the bank official would sign a receipt and hand it over with one word on it, tetelestai. So when Jesus cried out tetelestai, what was he meaning? Yes, of course, part of him must have been glad that his suffering was coming to an end, just as we will be when the effects of this awful coronavirus are finally over. But above all, Jesus was saying to his heavenly Father, and in the hearing of those who were at the foot of the cross, It's finished. I've completed the work you gave me to do. I've paid the debt in full. And that means for you and for me, the way to God is fully open. It is finished. Yes, Jesus' work on earth, culminating in the cross, was complete. But, but that wasn't the end of the story. Beauty
Jesus' friends were sad. They would never see their best friend again. How could this happen? Wasn't Jesus the rescuer, the king God had promised? It wasn't supposed to end like this. Yes, but whoever said anything about the end? Just before sunrise on the third day, God sent an earthquake, an angel from heaven. And when the guards saw the angel, they fell down with fright. The angel rolled the huge stone away, sat on top of it and waited. At first glimmer of dawn, Mary Magdalene and other women headed to the tomb to wash Jesus' body. The early morning sun slanted through the ancient olive trees. Drops of dew glittered on the leaves and grasses. Little tears everywhere. The friends walked quietly along the hilly path and through the olive groves until they reached the tomb and immediately noticed something odd. It was wide open. They peered through the opening in the dark tomb. But wait! Jesus' body was gone. And something else, a shining man was there with clothes made from lightning. Don't be scared, the angel said. But they couldn't help it. They, they screamed anyway. The angel asked them, what are you doing here? This is a tomb and tombs are for dead people. The women couldn't speak. Jesus isn't dead anymore, he said. He's alive again. And their hearts leapt and the angel laughed with such gladness that they felt for a moment as if they had woken from a nightmare. The other women rushed home, but Mary stayed behind. How could it be true? Jesus was definitely dead. How could he be alive? And just then, Mary heard someone else in the garden. Perhaps it's the gardener, she thought. He'll know where Jesus' body is. I don't know where Jesus is, Mary said urgently. I, I can't find him, but it was all right. Jesus knew where she was, and he had found her. Mary. Only one person said her name like that. She could hear her heart thumping. She turned around. She could just make out a figure. As she shaded her eyes to see and thought she was dreaming. She wasn't dreaming. She was seeing. Jesus. Mary fell to the ground. Sudden tears filled her eyes and great sobs shook her whole body. And all she wanted in that moment was to cling to Jesus and never let him go. You'll be able to hold on to me later, Mary, Jesus said gently, and always be close to me. But now go and tell the others that I'm alive. Mary ran and ran all the way to the city. She had never run so fast or so far in all her life. She felt like she could run forever. She didn't even feel her feet touch the ground. The sun seemed to be dancing and gleaming and bounding across the sky, racing and shining brighter than she could ever remember in the clean, fresh air. And it seemed to her that morning, as she ran, almost as if the whole world had been made anew, almost as if the whole world was singing for joy. The trees, tiny sounds in the grass, the birds, her heart. Was God really making everything sad come untrue? Was he making even death come untrue? She couldn't wait to tell Jesus' friends. They won't believe it, she laughed. She was right, of course. It's been said that there are two kinds of people, those who love surprises and those who hate them. You might say, well, it all depends what kind of surprise it is, and that's fair enough. But I think it's also to do with our personalities. Some of us by nature love surprise parties and gifts, whereas others like life to be a bit more predictable. We like to know the details of the plans in advance, be in control, maybe even produce a list of gifts we'd actually quite like to receive. As we've just heard, even though Jesus knew it is finished wasn't the end of the story. The thought of never seeing him again was totally heartbreaking for his mother Mary and others who had loved and followed him over the years. It's not surprising that they thought it wasn't supposed to end like this. And the amazing news of what we're celebrating on this Easter day is that it didn't. But thinking again about surprises, the first one the women got when they went to the tomb wasn't a good one in anyone's book. Bad enough that Jesus had died and now his body's gone. And the next surprise was clearly of the scary type, angelic beings in shiny clothes with a message they hardly dared to believe. He's not dead anymore. He's alive again. And as far as what happened next is concerned, 
I wonder if the women who went home may have been the types who perhaps didn't like surprises too much anyway, whereas Mary Magdalene stayed near the garden tomb and got the most wonderful, amazing, life-changing surprise of her life as the first person to meet with the risen Jesus. It wasn't clear at first, but as soon as she heard him call her name Mary, she knew for certain it was no ghost, no illusion, it was Jesus. Some years ago I was working in uh, Manchester Diocese and I took a service of baptism and confirmation in Strangeways Prison. There were four guys standing in front of me who had in different ways come to faith in Jesus Christ and were now ready to make their commitment public. Before praying for them and laying hands on their heads, I looked the first of them in the eye and said, John, God has called you by name and made you his own. Before I could continue, he shouted out, Yes, he has! And then started to apologise for getting so carried away. I said, Please don't apologise. I wish more people were enthusiastic and excited about knowing God loved and called them. And he said this to me. You see, in here, most of the time, I'm known by a number. And it just really hit me that God doesn't only just love me, doesn't just know me, but he calls me by name. You see, John had the same experience as Mary Magdalene. And even if we're not in prison, we're often asked for numbers, aren't we, to identify ourselves, say on a bank or credit card or an insurance policy. In this present coronavirus crisis in which we're all caught up, among other things, we hear each day the depressing statistics of the numbers of those affected by the virus, along with those who have sadly died. And one day last week, when we received the desperately sad news that one of our closest friends had died in hospital as a result of contracting the virus, and I later heard that day's statistics, I wanted to do a John and say, my friend Paul was one of those. He's not a number. He's got a name. Whether your name is Mary Magdalene, John, Paul, whatever it may be, at the heart of the true message of the many Easter surprises, is that you are deeply loved and known by name and the risen Jesus is calling it now. Mary couldn't wait to tell all the others and surprise, surprise, they had problems with leaving her. But gradually that changed as each of them met with the risen Jesus. You know, for me, the most compelling evidence for Jesus' resurrection is the radical change in those first disciples from being desperately frightened to being utterly fearless and you can only account for that as a result of their encounter with him and that is still happening and possible today so will you pause listen for Jesus calling, calling your name inviting you into the costly and often surprising adventure of following him and as you do so discover that the empty tomb can meet for each of us a life in all its fullness
So now we turn our prayers to the world, to our country and to our leaders. On this Easter Sunday, we pray for Christians around the world who will be celebrating this Easter in secret. Those who fear persecution for praising your holy name. For all those around the world who are living in isolation at the moment, for whom there will be no personal physical contact with other people today. May they know your love and presence and feel the closeness of their Christian family, even in these times. We pray for our planet. As flights are grounded and less traffic is on the roads, we have already seen huge reductions in air pollution, in all those gases which are impacting our world so badly. We pray for the healing of the planet to continue that air quality will improve for all those countries who live under constant smog. We pray for all our world leaders, for the organisations which are working to defeat this virus. May they work together for the good of all people and not use this situation to score political points. We pray for all the scientists and medical experts who are searching for a cure, a vaccine and a test for COVID-19. We thank you for all the organisations and businesses which have put their own aims and profits to one side to join in the battle and share their expertise and finances. We thank you that we live in a country where social distancing is possible. But we think of all those around the world where this is not possible. For people living in the slums of India and African nations who are crammed together and who must be so scared of this virus spreading. Bring your peace and your protection to them. We bring before you all the people around the world who have contracted coronavirus. For those who are in hospitals, may they receive all the care that they need to make a full recovery. We pray for all the medical staff who are risking infection to treat them. Keep them safe in your hands. Lockdown may protect us from the spread of coronavirus, but for many people it puts them in other dangers. We pray for anyone in an abusive relationship who may now be trapped with their partners, for children who are being neglected, beaten or not fed properly. We pray for the work of Bernardo's, Refuge and other charities who continue to try to support vulnerable people. May you guide them to the places they are needed and show them how to help in these difficult times. 
We know that coronavirus has not stopped all the other issues of the world. And so we pray for all those suffering famine, displacement, war, slavery, persecution. Let our eyes not be blinkered by corona, but let us continue to see the atrocities of the world and not stand by, but take action where we can. We thank you that through your name, we can come boldly before you and pray with confidence according to your will and know that you hear us. So it's in your name that we pray and believe. Amen. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, that you are with us through this storm. We thank you, God, that you are for us in this storm, Lord. We all know of somebody that is vulnerable, whether it's uh, mentally vulnerable or, or physically vulnerable or spiritually vulnerable right now, God. We just offer them to you and we just ask for our families and our friends that are, are close to us to draw close to you at this time, Lord. We pray, God, that you would bring down the barriers between them and you, Lord. We pray, God, that the floodgates of heaven would open up over their lives, Lord. We thank you, God, that you are holding our hands through this, holding their hands through this. And we ask, God, that you would just become more and more and more real to them during this time. We pray especially for those that are vulnerable, God. Father, those that are in our minds right now who we care for, who we love. Father, that you would surround them, that you would, that your peace would penetrate their spirit, God, like a peace that they've never known before. Father, I pray, God, that you would just... Give us peace too for them, Lord, that we wouldn't worry about them, but we'd know that they're in your hands, Lord, that you have all of this in your hands, God. Even when we don't see it, Lord, we know that you are there. We know that you care. We know that you are a good, good Father, Lord. And Father, I pray right now, Lord, that you'd help us as Christians to raise up, to raise up and rise up, Lord, in our own spirits, God, that we would be there, the hands and feet of Jesus whether it's through deed, through word, through um, prayer, Lord, we just pray that we would ri raise up our spirits, rise up our spirits, God, and that we would be Jesus to these people, Lord, that we would help them to see you through this time, Lord, that we would be the peacemakers through this time, Lord, that we would be the ones that are carrying something that people will see as truth, Lord. Father, I thank you, God, that you are with us. I thank you, God, that you are for us. I thank you, God, that you are still there and that you are holding us at this time. And we pray so much for our friends, for our families, God, that they would come close to you. They would draw close to you and you would draw close to them. Father God, I just want to raise up everybody that we're thinking of right now and I place them into your hands and I ask, Lord, that you would just have your way. In Jesus' name. Amen. Lord Jesus, as we celebrate your resurrection on this Easter day, we acknowledge that things are far from normal and it's hard not to be with friends and family today and not to be able to worship with our church community. This year we've journeyed very personally through Holy Week, seeing your courage, your suffering and your isolation mirrored in life around us. But thank you, Jesus, that you're rising to new life gives us hope for the future and brings us joy and security even when the world around us is uncertain. Your victory over death gives us confidence in eternal life and speaks into our fear of death and dying. As we seek to live in the light of your resurrection, give us eyes to see the new spring life around us, ears to hear the bird song, and hearts open to your love and peace. Amen. You know, today is all about grace. Uh, and, and grace is a word that we don't often hear in today's society. You might know a friend or someone's daughter who's called grace, but it's not a word that we fully understand. And I was thinking about the word and, and trying to work out how best to, to talk about it. And, you know, I've got three daughters and pretty often they have fights and they punch each other and they say mean things to each other and they, they, they can really hurt each other and, and often me and my wife have to go in and we have to try and heal that situation for them. Um, I guess grace is like on, on the worst of those days when 
one of my daughters has said something so hurtful to the other of my daughters and it'd be like that hurt daughter turning around and giving the daughter who'd hurt her her most precious possession like just offering it to her you know not something she deserved um, but just giving her her most precious possession and you know Jesus was God's only son talk about precious um, it kind of sums it up in the Bible in in it says, for God so loved the world so much that he gave his only son so that everyone, everyone who believes in him may not die, but have eternal life. And this next bit's really important because I think people get this mixed up with what they think about the church and what has been, I just, just stereotypes, but it says, for God did not send his son into the world to judge it, to condemn it, but to be its saviour. I don't know where you're at today, you know, um, for some of you, you probably know this and you're grateful for this and I think I would just encourage you to take time today and, and be grateful to, to Jesus for what he did for you. And if you yet to discover this, if you don't know this, if you have questions, if you you don't fully understand what the concept of why Jesus died on the cross for you, send us a message. Uh, we'd love to chat. We'd love to answer your questions. Um, and even better, if you're not sure, if you're not comfortable messaging us, just say something like this in your heart, on your own, to God and say, God, if you're real, show me. And I promise you that he will. And um, accepting the gift, it's the greatest love story ever told this Easter. And accepting that gift into your life will be the best gift that you will ever, ever receive. I'm just gonna close this service today with this, um, this blessing for you all and for your families, for your loved ones, for your children. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace.